ahead and have a seat, would you? And we'll stand forgiven. That's the words of a clean slate that we can come before God under the cross of Jesus Christ and we can know that we are forgiven in him, past tense, done. Amen? Can you say done for me today? Say done. Excellent. Excellent. We're starting a brand new series today and we're starting a series on the life of Joseph. And if you're thinking Christmas time and we're talking about the father of Jesus, wrong Joseph. So there's two, two big Josephs in scripture. We're going to be talking about the Old Testament Joseph. Um, this was turned into a musical, I think in the late seventies. Uh, <laughs> jo- the Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, I think it was called. Um, so he had the coat of many colors and some of you guys went to Sunday school and and you saw it on the flannel graph, and he had like the striped colored um, coat, and we're going to talk about that coat in just a little bit. But we're going to do this in about five to six weeks, and we're just going to go through these chapters together in the scripture, and we're going to study it. So some of you guys really love these moments when we do a book of the Bible or we do a section of scripture as a church together. It, we're in one of those seasons, so it's going to be very, very fun. So as we go through these, let me just encourage you, maybe be reading these during your quiet times as well during the week to see what God would speak to you in the quiet place. Maybe also be talking about these passages in your life group across this time as well. Like I said, we're going to spend five or six weeks. There's actually 13 chapters. Genesis 37 is where we're going to start today. Genesis 37 to Genesis 50. And and many of you guys have read parts of the Old Testament. You know that usually when you get a character in the Old Testament, you might get six or seven verses for them. But then every once in a while, it stops and it gives you a massive amount of detail about somebody's life in the Old Testament. It's because we're really supposed to pay close attention to this person. And this person, Joseph, is one of those people that we're going to read about. So um, before we get into today's narrative, I've got to give you the prequel. I've got to give you the backstory. So just so that you know where we are, a little bit of the backstory starts with Abraham. Abraham, do you know Abraham? Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had father. Abraham, Abraham was called the father of the faith. Amazing guy, amazing walk of faith that he had with God. And and Abraham was given, because he was so filled with faith, he was given the promises by God. Two very, very important promises, if you know the story. First off, he was told that a mighty nation was going to be born through his line, which is really amazing because he and his wife couldn't have kids. And then God does a miracle, and they have a son. His name's Isaac. And, 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 and they have kids, and a mighty nation is going to come from him. And not only is that the first promise, but the second promise is that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. And what that is, is that's a prophecy about Jesus. What God is saying to Abraham is that you're going to have this amazing nation. This is the Jewish people. This is the Israelite nation. And then someone's going to come. Do you know his name? Jesus is going to come. And when Jesus comes, he's going to die on the cross for everyone, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Jesus, through the line of Abraham. Make sense this morning? So that's kind of the backstory. And even though Abraham is this amazing man of faith, he's also a bit complicated. He's also kind of a dysfunctional person. So one thing Abraham does is he's got kind of a pattern of lying in his life. Every time Abraham gets scared, and you'll see it if you read the scriptures honestly, is he'll, in order to save himself or to save his wife, he'll lie about what's happening. And so this, this, it's just this complex thing, this, this mix of like, we got amazing faith, but then we lie whenever we get scared. Sound familiar? Sound like your messy Christian life at all? And so that he does that. Um, He also introduces polygamy. Um, having multiple wives. So Abraham actually has two sexual partners in his life. And this is troubling. Amen? This is troubling. And then he has two different kids, Ishmael and Isaac, as a result. But only, only the promise and the, the, the family line will go through Isaac. And, 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 and we understand all of that from Sunday school, or at least we claim to understand it all from Sunday school. But it's still messy because Hagar, the mom, and Ishmael are treated poorly in the scripture by Abraham and by Sarah. And so it's a mix. It's complicated. So that's, that's Abraham's family. Now let's go down into Isaac's family. Isaac has one, one wife, so he gets that part right. But he has two kids, Esau and Jacob. 
Esau and Jacob, and they're twins. And he loves on Esau, and he favors Esau all through their growing up years. And Jacob is in the background, and he hates this, right? And he, he feels undervalued by this, and this is painful, and this is difficult for the younger Jacob. But then the line goes through Jacob. And then when Jacob becomes older, he's also dysfunctional. He has four sexual partners. So I'm going to give you a quick picture of that. So Jacob marries Leah and her um, handmaiden. Uh, it's called Bilhah. And then he marries Rachel and her handmaiden, Zilpah. So he has four sexual partners, Jacob does. Polygamy is a big thing for him. And he has all these kids, batches of kids. Call it four batches of kids. And things get complicated. Can you imagine being at the head of this family? Can you imagine how complicated that would be? Very complicated. I don't recommend it. And of all of these kids, jo Joseph and Benjamin are the favorites because Rachel is his favorite. Do you see how he goes through all this pain in his own family and from his own parents about one being favorite over another? And then he comes and he repeats the exact same idea in his own family, which is so surprising, especially if you're young today, because you're currently convinced that you're going to cut off every problem from the family that you grew up with, and you're not going to repeat any of that, right? And all the older folks are laughing right now. Because we've all had the moment where we got to a certain age and we looked in the mirror and said, oh, God, help me. I've done it all again. And that's what he does. And so he's got a favorite wife, Rachel, and he's got a favorite child, Joseph. And let me give you their ages just really quickly. Most of the brothers in the narrative that we're about to start out with in, in chapter 37, Joseph is going to be 17 years old. Most of his older brothers are going to be in their 30s or 40s. So there's a large age gap there as well. And we're going to get into this dysfunctional family together. But first, I've got to give you kind of a scholarly moment, kind of a theological note. And this is on how to interpret your Bible because you're going to see me do some things throughout this passage. And maybe you've not seen a pastor do it before. And I want you to know why. So we're going to go college class for about a minute and a half. Can you handle it? I promise it'll be brief, and then we'll get to the fun stuff. Five rules for reading Bible narratives or Bible stories. Now, behind this slide right here of these five rules, and I know it looks so boring, doesn't it? But here's the really big thing. It's the number one thing that I learned at seminary. In my years of seminary, the number one thing that I pulled out of it was this, that whenever you read the Bible, read the Bible how Jesus read it. Whenever you interpret what scripture actually means. The rules are interpret it like Jesus interpreted scripture. Because we've all had this experience, have we not? Where we've, we've had a, a pastor, a preacher, maybe even a parent interpret a Bible passage and we're like, I don't think that means what you think it means. And some of it's been wrong, but some of it's been really wrong and really destructive. And so maybe you've had those experiences and you're like, how do I know what to trust? How do I know how to read the Bible for myself? How do I know how to do this? This is a beginning for you. Rule number one is we interpret the Bible the way that Jesus did. And here's five ways I saw Jesus interpret the scripture. And I could go deeper, but I'm going to keep it kind of light for you today. Number one, these are true events. So when we read about Joseph and his story today, these are true events that happened in real time and space. Amen? Amen, because that's the way Jesus treated it. Number two, we're going to find where God inserts himself into their very real human complicated story. Number three, we're going to expect people to live messy, sinful lives because they're sinful, messy people. And then number four, we're going to read their behavior heart. We're not going to read, sorry. Don't read their behavior and heart as necessarily reflecting God's heart. And that's where a lot of us get it wrong. Number five, you're going to have to look deep and realize that the events themselves will show judgment on the faults of some of those characters. So let's take polygamy for a second here. And I know there's not a lot of controversy about whether or not we all like polygamy, okay? I realize that. But some people do struggle when they see an Old Testament character who takes part in that. And it's like, how am I supposed to feel about that? Here's the way you're supposed to feel about that. 
that was part of that culture, and it was a broken part of that culture. And this ancient person of God who's recorded in the scripture, they were living out part of their culture that was broken, and that is not the Bible affirming that. And so what you see start to happen is every time polygamy shows up in the Old Testament narrative, things go bad. So the Old Testament writers do not write about someone who takes part in polygamy and it's like, look at all the wonderful things that happened as a result. It's never that way. We always see the dysfunctional family aspect come from this mistake. And then you jump ahead into the New Testament and it gives us the qualifications for New Testament elders. And one of the qualifications that it lists there is must be a husband of one wife. One wife one spouse. Is it making sense today? The heart of God is finally revealed in this New Testament scripture. And we see the same thing with things like slavery. And some of you guys have had questions about slavery. It's like, wait a second, I see slavery existing in some of these biblical narratives, but it's not affirmed. And once you get to the book of Philemon in the New Testament, it's very much spoken against. This is not God's will for Philemon. So you see that with racism. You see that with several things throughout the scripture. There's even one moment, this is so powerful, where Jesus says this, and it's, this is in Mark chapter 10, verse 4, if you're taking notes. But Jesus specifically talks about divorce in the Old Testament and says, even though it was talked about, even though it's discussed by Moses, that was never God's heart for marriage. And so Jesus says, you see a narrative about it, but that's not God affirming that practice in that culture. All right, class is done. Are we okay? Everybody all right? Okay, let's look at this. This is Joseph's lie. This is Genesis 37, verse 2. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. And he worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his brothers were doing. Again, Joseph is 17 years old. His brothers are in their 30s and 40s. And he reports back. Now, why is he reporting back? He's acting like a supervisor. He's acting like like an inspector. And he's inspecting his brothers. And his inspection is not good. Now, if you're a brother who's been taking care of sheep all your life and you're in your 30s or 40s, you're the expert, are you not? And 17-year-old punk comes running along and says, I'm going to inspect your work. Is that a good day? I don't think that's a good day. And that's, that's sowing some bad feelings, can we say? And then he goes back to his father, Jacob. Now, I'm just going to warn you about this because I struggle with it in first service. They're both J names, Jacob and Joseph. I may randomly flip them accidentally today. I'm going to try not to. But if I confuse you, that's why. So Joseph, the 17-year-old, comes back with the inspection to his father, Jacob, and gives him a bad report. And those bad things right there, the Hebrew there is dibarah. And, and, and I pointed that out because the way this passage reads is he's just reporting the truth about the bad things that his brothers are doing. I actually think that that's a bad translation. I think what it's supposed to say is Joseph lied about the report. And a lot of us were not taught that in Sunday school. But I did a really deep dive on that particular word. Every other time it's used in the Hebrew, it implies that a misleading report was given. I think Joseph lied. I'm just going to leave it there because he's messy and he's a person. Verse 3, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. And that Hebrew word there, and I'm be done with Hebrew after this, that Hebrew word right there, um, we've been told is a multicolored coat, right? Because it looked great on the flannel graph in in, uh, Sunday school. Um, But That's not actually what that means. What it means is a robe where the sleeves went all the way down to the wrist and where the robe went all the way down to the ankles. It was a rich and an ornate robe. Why would it go down to the wrist? Because you're not blue collar and you're not working hard in this thing. 
See, if you were going to be out working with the sheep and getting sweaty in the sun and all that kind of stuff, you'd have something where the sleeves were way up here, yes? Just, just for practical. But if somebody handed you a robe where the sleeves went all the way down to the wrist, that's meant for formal occasions or you're a formal person who's never going to get his hands dirty. And so when Jacob, the dad, gives Joseph this particular robe that's ornate, I mean, it's high style, but... It's also signaling you're a supervisor now. Your management. You're not going to work with your hands. Do you see the favor of his 17-year-old son over the guys with all the experience in their 30s and 40s? He's made him permanently now management. And the, the brothers loved that, by the way. So verse 5. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up. You can like see this in Pixar animation, right? <laughs> suddenly my bundle of grain stood up, and your bundles of grain, they all gathered around my bundle, and they bowed low before mine. So we're going to talk about this dream in just a second, but let me just talk about the theme of dreams for, for a quick moment because this is setting up the series. Dreams are going to be a big theme for us here because Joseph is a dreamer. Uh, he's going to have multiple dreams today, and then once he gets to jail in Egypt, because that's coming, he's going to interpret dreams. He's going to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. Dreams are a big, big deal, not only for him, but also for his dad. Jacob had been a dreamer. Some of you guys know Stairway to Heaven and, or, the, or the Ladder to Heaven, and the angels are walking down between earth and heaven. That dream was had by his father, Jacob, the wrestling with God moment. He is a, Jacob, his dad, was a dreamer. So this is another link between father and son. Dreams are a big deal. So here's the question. Why go tell the brothers the dream? I mean, it's one thing to have the dream. But like, you know, why tell them? So look at their response. Verse 8, the brothers responded, so you think that you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will rule over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way that he talked about them. I've seen people in the church get a spiritual gift from God where they hear God's voice, even if it's not audibly where they get a strong leading from him. Maybe they see a vision. Maybe they get a dream. And it's this powerful gift. Praise God for that. I believe in that, by the way. Praise God for that. But here's the thing. If God speaks to you, sometimes it's not the best deal to go and tell somebody else about it right away. Sometimes we can have a gift, but we don't have the maturity to go along with the gift. Sometimes we got the gift and God wants to tell us a thing, but it doesn't mean tell somebody else now about it because that can make trouble. I knew a friend who was dating a girl and they just had like one or two dates and he felt like God had told him she was going to be his future wife. And he told her, it's a bad idea. Just some of you young men, that's a bad idea. You might say, well, why did God give him the dream in the first place? So think it through. Maybe God gave him this dream about the oversight that he would have with his brothers, the honor that he would have with his brothers. And he was meant to keep that and to go through his life and to wait patiently for that dream to come about. And when that dream would one day in the future come about and he would see it, he would know that God had been in control all along. And he would know that God loved him enough to show him what the future was before it had ever happened. And he would come out with an amazing faith. He'd be a worshiper of God, wouldn't he? Joseph would. What an amazing thing that would be. Instead, what he does is he takes it straight to his brothers. It's a bad day. And why would you do it? Why would you tell them? I think this is just me. I think he expected them to bow right then and there. I don't know. Is it, is it foolishness? Is it arrogance? The scripture doesn't say. But they hate him. That's the real point. 
They hate him. I've got a slide for this. Here are the three hates in the passage that we just read. Verse 4, his brothers hated Joseph because their, their father loved him more. Verse 5, they hated him more than ever. In verse 8, they hated him all the more. Hate, hate, hate. It's big in this passage. And it's brewing and it's growing. Ever hear of Mount St. Helens? In 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. This is what it looked like before the eruption. And then after 1980, when it erupted, that's the crater that was left over. Joseph had no idea, seemingly, that he had a Mount St. Helens situation going on in his family. He just didn't know it. It was brewing. There was lava. There was pressure. There was gas. There was fire. Amen? And he didn't know it. But it's about to pop. So here's what happens. We're going to read verse 18. His brothers are going to take all the flocks and they're going to go to a distant land and they're going to pasture them somewhere else. We're not necessarily told why, but the dad, Jacob, sends young Joseph in his super fancy coat to go inspect the brothers again. And Mount St. Helens is going to go off. Verse 18, when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. And as he approached, they, plan they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer they said. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe that he was wearing. They go right after the cursed robe. Do you see the emotion? That thing's got to come off of him. And then they grabbed him and they threw him into the cistern. That's, that's like a well. It's probably about 12 feet deep, scholars tell us, about 12 feet deep. They grabbed him, threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and they saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. And then Judah said to his brothers, and this is beautiful drama right here. What would we gain by killing our brother? Because that's what they were going to do. They threw him down in the well, figure out how to kill him, what to do with the body. We, if we kill our brother, we'll have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. So Judah is not a heartfelt guy here. Okay? Again, no matter how you remember this growing up, it's... They, they did not choose to not kill him out of kindness to him. They just didn't want to have to deal with his body. This is in your Bibles, by the way. Judah there is one of the older brothers. And Jesus is born from what tribe of Israel? Do you remember? The tribe of Judah. So this is the forefather of Jesus himself. Talk about coming from a messy family. So what the brothers do is they sell Joseph at this point into slavery. These Ishmaelite traders come along. They take 20 shekels of silver for him. It's a very, very small amount of money for their brother, by the way. It's another slap in the face to him. And he's sold off into Egypt into, to uh, Potiphar, to Potiphar's household. So all that's next week that we're going to be covering. But in order to cover, cover up the crime, they kill a young goat. And they take the fancy robe and they put it in the blood and they take it back to the father, Jacob. And of course, Jacob goes into mourning and believes that his son has been killed by a wild animal. And that's the end of today's story. I want to leave us with this picture of Joseph in a pit today. And I really want to dive in deep on that. Because being at the bottom of a 12-foot hole with no way out, I think is a powerful idea. Because what was he thinking when he was down there? Can you, in your imagination, can you see him for a minute? He can't get out. The brothers are going to say later on in the, in, in the narrative, they're going to remember back to this moment once they're all older and they reconcile, because they are going to reconcile. But they're going to remember that he had pled for his life and they refused to hear him. So he's pleading for his life down the, down the bottom of that 12-foot hole. And what thoughts would have begun to occur to this young man while he's there, while he's trapped? Would he have started to realize what he did? Would he have started to, re to would, oh God, I shouldn't have told them about the dream. Oh God, 
Maybe I shouldn't have strutted in there with my fancy robe. Oh God, maybe I shouldn't have done an inspection so much with them. Did these thoughts start to occur to him at the bottom of the hole? Have you ever been at the bottom of a hole and you start thinking about how you got there? And here's the thing. Like, he might have started thinking about that. He might have started to learn about his own foolishness. I hope so. Because by the time we get into the next spot with Potiphar's house, he seems to be a very different guy. He seems to have grown up quite a bit. But here in this hole, what's he starting to learn? And and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying because he did a lot of foolish things, that means he deserved to be sold into slavery. No way. What Joseph did in this passage, as foolish as he was, they were misdemeanors, and they gave him death for it, basically, or a life sentence at least. So it it doesn't fit. And then some of you guys might look at the pit that he's in, and you might say, well, he needs to be in that pit. He needs to be in that pit because I went to Sunday school and I know how this ends. And I know that he's supposed to be sold into slavery so that he gets to Egypt. And once Joseph gets to Egypt, he's going to save everybody from this big famine. It's going to be this big, great thing. And sorry to ruin the ending for you, but that's where it's all headed. Some of you are like, he had to go into the pit. Did he? There's a lot of roads to Egypt, folks. I don't know that you got to get sold into slavery in order to help people out in Egypt. Could God have accomplished his purposes, a whole lot of different paths, gotten Joseph there to where he needed to go? Of course he could have. Here's the point. Sometimes we end up in the pit, and sometimes it's our fault. Sometimes it's somebody else's fault. But don't lay it on God every time. Because sometimes we do that. We say, if God brings something out of it, it must have been God put me there. We look back at some of the darkest events of our lives and we see that good came out of those dark events and we say, well, God must have wanted that for me. Not necessarily. God allows people to make choices in this world. I don't believe God put him in that pit. But I believe God used the pit. God brought good out of the pit. And God was there with him in the pit because that's what God does. The Bible says God causes all things. This is Romans 8, 28, if you're taking notes. God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. God causes all things, all the bad in your life. He causes good to come out of it. He uses all the bad and he creatively puts together a story that brings good into your life from the bad. That doesn't make God the author of the bad. Yes, God will use the pit. James 1, 2 through 4 says it like this. Dear brothers and sisters, love this. It says, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. What's James saying? He's saying sometimes you're in a pit. Sometimes you're going through trials. Sometimes you're going through difficult times in your life. And God wants to use those. God wants to squeeze every ounce of potential out of that difficulty in your life to your character. He wants to grow you. Somebody during our prayer meeting today said, this is kind of like getting socks for Christmas. Give you a second on that one. Of all the gifts that I could get from God, I'm not sure trials are at the top of my list. (laughs) Yes. Consider it joy. Sure, James. Good for you, buddy. See the gift that God brings through the pit. Because when you go through the pit, there's amazing stuff there if you'll let God teach you, if you'll let God change you. My sister has four boys. One of her sons was going to school, and this boy was um, just straight-A student, okay? Really, really great, well-behaved, wonderful guy. And this this whole situation happened. It was like late grade school, I think, when it happened. might have been junior high. 
But like they had this whole history with him and things were going great. And all of a sudden out of the blue, he starts struggling with his grades in this one class. And then they get a call from the teacher who wants to do a parent-teacher conference. And they go to the parent-teacher conference. And the teacher starts explaining to them, hey, your son is a real problem in class. Your son is really disruptive. Your son doesn't get along with me. Your son, your son, your son, bad, bad grades. And, 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 and the teacher starts to tell mom and dad, I think there's a behavioral issue here. And I think you need to put your son on medication in order to handle the behavioral issue so he can get through my class. Super heavy. And it's all at once, kind of out of the blue. And they start trying to reason with this teacher, and they start trying to work with this teacher. And it was like this brick wall kind of a thing. And, and they're a very solid, very mature family. And so they weren't just going to throw out everything that the teacher had to say. So they started reaching out to other leaders from church and from the, the, the community that worked with their sons. Like, have you noticed big shifts in him? Have you noticed that there's problems here? They reached out to old teachers. Have you noticed problems? And, and, and the answer was, no, 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 he's, he's doing great. So they made the very odd decision. And if you're a parent, you know how odd this is. They made a decision that they had a bad teacher. And I remember her telling me this. And I'm like, what are you going to do? Like, Get him fired, right? What are you going to do? So this is her answer. She's like, my son throughout his life is going to have bad bosses. It's going to have bad professors. So this is our opportunity to teach him the skills for how to walk through a situation like this when you've got a difficult oversight person. The deep lessons of how do I respect someone who maybe isn't deserving of my respect. To not make trouble. All the things. Your your brain can spin on that. All the things. She's like, we're going to take this opportunity to do that. Do you hear the heart of my sister? She's an amazing parent. That's awesome. Do you see the heart of God the Father saying, when you go into your own pit, there are things that I'm going to bring out of it for you. It may be difficult, but there's gold there. If you'll let it teach you, there's gold there. Amen? So let's look at what the gold is. Socks at Christmas, amen? Not sure I want any of this, but here it comes. Gold number one, the gift that only the pit can give. It's the truth, it's the lesson in your life that there will be trouble in this life. Jesus says in John 16, 33, he said, in this life, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And every single time I hear that verse, I hear a mic drop at the end. Jesus says, but I have overcome the world. That's your hope. That's what you hold on to. That's what you trust. This used to be my life verse. I've got a new one now. I'll tell you about that one later, but this used to be my life verse. Because I loved that Jesus was honest with us about the fact that there would be trouble in this life. Because many of us are going through this life expecting everything to be comfortable. Expecting everything to be rosy. And then when something goes wrong, we're surprised. We're shocked that a loving God would let us go through that. Now Jesus said in this life you will have trouble. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Next lesson, next gift you get in the pit is that you are not in control. And we so often think we're in control. But you are not. Romans 12, verse 3. I'm sorry, this is Philippians 4, verse 12. says, I have learned, this is Paul talking, I have learned the secret of living with a full stomach or an empty stomach. He learned the secret of contentment. Paul said, I've learned the secret of having much or having little. We do not, we do not come up as kids knowing what it is to have an empty stomach and being okay with it. To not have the things that we want, not have the things that we were going for. And to to be able to endure disappointment and say, God is still God and he's still on the throne and he's still good. When's the last trial that taught you that lesson? That God is still God, he's on the throne and he's still good, even though I'm not getting what I want right now. 
Come on. Yes? God's got gold for us. What's the next one? You're not that important. <laughs> Seeing if you were awake today. Romans 12, 3 says, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but consider others more important than you. It's hard. It's hard. Aren't these the deep things, though, that you want your kids to know? Aren't these the life lessons? And do you see how they exist in the pit, by the way? We have to go through difficult times where we see these truths. They come into sharp, three-dimensional focus for us. But you're not that important. <clears throat> Will Smith slapped Chris Rock in the face. And he is currently, I'm not going to say anything more about it, but he is currently in the penalty box in our culture. Is he not? In a moment, that man's life was changed. Now, I have not psychoanalyzed him from afar. I will just take some guesses here. I would guess that he felt more of an important person than he does today. And that when that moment happened and when he went into that cultural penalty box, that stripped him of some of his perceived importance. And that stripping of his importance was painful for himself. But is he any less loved by God today than he was before? Is his worth in the eyes of God the Father any different? And sometimes we go through this life even as believers and we want the importance. We want the reputation. Whether it comes from God or not, we want it. And do you see what's going on with Joseph here? That coat being stripped of Joseph is preparation for what he needs to learn and see and become in the whole rest of the story. His importance had to get stripped so that was, what was important was really important, the love of God for him, because you could never lose that, and it could never be taken away from you. I'm going to go fast through the others. Your purpose isn't about you. Genesis 50, verse 20. More socks at Christmas. Here we go. Your purpose isn't about you. This life is not about you. Your life is not about you. And Joseph also learns this. He gets this dream. He gets this coat. He gets his father's favoritism. He thinks it's all about him, but it is not. And that's what he's about to learn through all of these years of slavery. It's a massive, massive lesson for him to learn. Um, and Joseph says in Genesis 50, verse 20, he's going to say at the very end of this, again, I'm going to run the end of the story for you, but we're going to get there, is he's going to say, what you meant for evil, God meant for good to the saving of many lives. And what he means is by, my, by me getting here to, to Egypt, I was going to save all of the ancient world from this famine. going to save God's people from the, from the famine. And God had a purpose. But guess what? The purpose wasn't Joseph. The purpose was outside of Joseph. It was the saving of all those people. Amen? He was part of it. But the purpose, it, life isn't about you. Next, your time is limited. Number five is the most exciting of the list. You're going to die. <laughs> What'd you learn in church today? I'm going to die. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days, God. Teach us to, to meditate and to understand that our days are limited and the more we stop to understand that our days are limited and how precious they are in the eyes of God, we got to get busy, do we not? We got to get busy doing the things that God has called us to do. And we can't take them for granted. We can't take tomorrow for granted. That's all throughout the scripture. And don't we wake up to that more in the pit than any place else? See, some of these lessons can't be learned, not really, anywhere else, except when we're struggling. The next one you're not alone in the pit, Isaiah 43, 2. When you walk through the fire, God says, I will be with you. Number seven, you needed the pit all along because there were lessons, there, were, there was gold, there were Christmas socks waiting for you there. And then lastly, you're more than the pit. 
In James 1.12, he talks about coming out on the other side of that trial and what you will have gained. God's pleasure over us. And I bring this up last because I just want to remind you that the pit is not your destiny. Because some of you, for real, this isn't theory for you this morning. Like, you're in it right now. And while you're in it right now, one of the lies of the enemy that's coming against you is that you are here in this darkness and it will never be light again. That's the voice of despair. Amen? Come on, God's people. Where are you at? That's the voice of despair. And it's the voice of hell. This is not the end of you. You're more than the pit. Trust God. Know he's there with you. Know he's got things on the other side of it for you. Know that part of what he's building into you is all of these things. And he's making you strong in the faith. He's, he's building your character. He's making you into a different person than you were before. And one of the great pleasures of the walk of Jesus Christ is not only that we're forgiven, brothers and sisters, it's that God does not leave us stuck where we are. Who's happy about the fact that they're not stuck where they are? I'm happy about the fact I'm not stuck. I get to grow. I get to change. Some people, sometimes people look at you and they say, he, they, they're this way, they'll always be that way. See, that's the voice of hopelessness. That's wrong. Jesus has brought us in Christ that we might change, and like James says, that we might grow from glory to glory Line on line, precept on precept, God has a plan for you to change you. Amen? Amen. Would you guys stand? I want you to glance again at this list before I pray. Any of those things, has God got you on those lessons right now? Which ones? Which of those has he been using a pit in your life? Or maybe he did it in the past to bring that one to you. And as he shows you that, maybe right now, just in the quietness of this moment, you could thank him. Maybe you could just quietly pray. Thank you for not leaving me stuck, Lord. Thank you for teaching me. Thank you for growing me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you so much. God, I love how individual you are with us today, God. I love all the things that, the amazing things that you wanted to bring into the heart of Joseph, God, and the the amazing things you want to bring into our hearts today. God, I pray that we would be moldable clay in your hands. God, I pray that we would not hate the place that we are, but God, that we would trust you in the place where we are. Come and teach us. Thank you, Lord.